we've looked in this, um, in this series at quite a number of, uh, of subjects like hypertension and heart disease and uh, diabetes. And one of the common denominators is obesity. And so we're going to look at that. I wish we had the time to look at cancer. Um, and at arthritis, those are, those are serious ones as well. Some of the principles that we are sharing, you know, forms the line that we will share even those topics. Um, but I must say, to really bring justice to, to this, diabetes, I normally use four hours, four hour sessions to present this. Um, the same with, uh, with cancer, I need about eight hours because there's such a lot of variance in it. So, um, yeah, for the time that we have, I think we're trying our best. And uh, so this afternoon, we're going to talk about obesity, the common line. Right through all of this, it is a problem. Um, have you ever seen this? <laughs> have you ever seen something like that it, it does tell us a story doesn't it you know the only the only species on this world that uh, struggle with obesity is the human species you just don't find this with with our animal kingdom and it is becoming an epidemic in much of today's society you know being blessed is not helpful now, I'm, I'm very careful of using this term because uh, there's a lot of sensitivity around being overweight. Unfortunately, there's, and, and I'll show it to you, you know, there's, there's a lot of side effects of this. And um, so at one point, people said, people, please, pastor, just don't talk about, you know, people are overweight. Um, rather, rather just say they are blessed. And some people are more blessed. And then I used that terminology at one session, and one person came down on me and said, never said that again. That is not blessed. That's a curse. It's not blessed. <laughs> so I'm not sure how to put it, guys. It's just being, you know, heavier than you should. I don't know how to say it. Um, Proverbs 23 verse 2 says, Put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's better for you to just put a knife to your throat if you cannot control your appetite. And basically, this is where the problem lies. You know, it's that we, we, we are struggling with it. And, and people don't, don't just think that, you know, some people are more prone to it. Yeah, it might be, but... Um, all of us have to control appetite. And it is true that some of us just have more willpower supposed to, to control it better than others. But there is some common denominators that we have to talk about. So in our presentation today, we're going to talk about, you know, what is obesity. We're going to try and, you know, say, you know, what are contributing or causative factors that we need to keep in mind when it comes to obesity. And who's affected? by it and then some complications with obesity and then yeah you know how to say goodbye obesity you know how can we do that you know permanently saying goodbye good riddance if you want to you know of of this of this problem now obesity can be described as an imbalance between the energy intake and expenditures such that excess energy is stored in fat cells which uh, uh, enlarge our, or increase in number. I mean, it just increases. And this is maybe why I used the terminology, you know, more blessed. <laughs> more blessed. Um, well, for adults, a, a body mass index, your BMI, is that which is greater than 25%. That's what we call, you know, overweight. Uh, obese is when you are bigger than 30%. A person is considered obese when you or her, her weight is 20% or more above the normal weight. So what we would say from, for your height um, and your gender, that's what it should be ideally 
and now it is 20% more than that ideal. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, there's some important factors around uh, encouraging obesity. Um, yeah, approximately 75% variation in, uh, in percent body fat in total fat mass, uh, mass index determined by culture and lifestyle, whereas 25% can be attributed to genetic factors. So it's, you know, once again, we get this, this thing where people say, well, it's in our genes. My mother was a big person and my dad is a big person. And his mother and father was big persons. So it's in the gene, I'm a big person. <laughs> you getting it? Um, now, food choice does play a role. Excessive calorie intake, high fats diet promote fat accumulation, significantly more than high carbohydrate diets because of the high energy density. The metabolic efficiency and the palatability, poor regulation, and uh, you know weak saturation effects of, of of fat, and so yeah, that is that, that plays a role. Education, I'm I'm just sharing some stats with you. Uh, there's a study that also established that low educational st uh, stat status was associated with high BMI in Black African women. And that's the health survey that we find from 2002. Um, the socio-cultural factors. In South Africa, there's a large cultural diversity that influences perceptions of body image. However, as a whole, South African men and women have inaccurate perceptions of their body weight. Very interesting studies. Um, for example, 9.7% of men and 22.1% of women of all races and ages perceive themselves as overweight, while 29.9% of men and 566 of women actually are overweight. <laughs> now, people got a wrong perception of you know, what is overweight. So, you know, and I've, I've had this many times in my, counsel uh, in my counseling sessions where um, you know, one can see the person is a little bit more blessed than they could be. And from their point of view, you know, at least, you know, I'm not fat like my mother. Like my mother was. Only 16% of the black South African women perceive themselves as overweight compared to 34% of women of mixed ancestry and 31% of Indian women and 54% of white women. Now that's an interesting perception. You, you, you do then find another mental sort of spin-off from this. Because now if, if white women all the time feel that they are overweight and they have more weight or they've got a better perception uh, of their real weight, it means that they are more mentally, it, it's taxing them because they are now more aware of this. And, and you know, it does cause a, a you know, a, a personal um, value problem, you know. I'm, I'm a fat person. Are you getting what we're trying to say? Now, therefore it appears that when analyzed by gender and eth uh, ethnicity, only white African women, South African women, are able to perceive their actual body weight accurately. Stress is another important factor. High levels of stress are associated with increased weight gain. And it's, you know, some people are emotional eaters. So more stress, more snack. You know, it, it's, 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 you know the thing, the term comfort food? So it, it makes me feel better. I mean, stress level, it makes me, that's uncomfortable. It makes me feel better when I have comfort food at the end of the day. Um, childhood obesity is another thing that really is now skyrocketing. Um, an inverse association between activities levels and fat mass measured by television viewing time has been reported in South Africa children. I mean, this is it. Um, we find more television looking, less activity. I mean, in my days, when we came from, back from school, we were climbing trees and playing cowboys and crooks. And I shot my brothers. I shot them. It was a kitty or it was something. I shot them. That they are alive, that is a miracle. 
this is the God that we serve. We don't find those activities now. We now look at the cameras and crooks are actually shooting each other on television. This is the activity we do. And we really get, you know, some, as I say, thumb muscle while we look at this using our remote. In a regional cross-sectional survey, children's health and fitness status of 12 to 18-year-old children in 14 schools in Western Cape, um, we found that the current levels of obesity were associated with inactivity as measured by television time, lower fitness levels. I did say that. And so, yeah, this is, this is real-time studies. Is this isolated to certain strata or areas of society? You know, I just mentioned Western Cape because this is where I did the research. No, no, it isn't. In 2014, more than 1.9 billion adults, 18 years and older, were overweight. And of these, over 600 million were obese. And this is why we had to put this as part of this whole goodbye disease package. Because uh, as some people struggle with diabetes and others struggle with um, hypertension and others struggle with cancer, there's people that's struggling with this obese disease. Uh, you know, I want to call it that way. Um, most of the world's population live in countries where overweight and obese obesity kills more people than underweight. I think in 2013 we actually crossed the border. We crossed that balance where there was more underweight, undernourished people in the world than overweight. Now it's, it's just the opposite now. Since 2014, there's more obese people than people undernourished. By the way, interesting that that is actually a biblical principle that is, that is prophesied. So go and look at our prophecies and saying, what is some of the things that's going to happen in the end of time before the Lord's going to come? And one of them is called sufficing and drunkenness. What is sufficing? Overeating. Overindulgence in food. 42 million children under the age of 5 were overweight or obese in 2013. And uh, I don't have the new stats, but I believe it's actually gone much higher than that. You just have to look around and you'll see that's the reality. In 2014, a Lancet study estimated that the number of overweight adults in the world was 2.1 billion in 2013 compared with 875 million in 1980. So you can see exponentially it's just skyrocketing. It's just, it's just skyrocketing. It is a big explosion in this. So we have a, we have, we're facing a double burden of disease. Many low middle income countries are now facing this double burden of disease. You know, they sit with this obesity thing with the diabetes, with the cancer, with the heart disease because it's all the common denominator. While they continue to deal with the problems of infections, disease and undernutrition, they are experiencing a rapid upsurge in non-communicable diseases, risk factors such as obesity and overweight, particularly in urban settings. You don't find this in the rural settings. Why? Why? They're still active. They're still planting their food. They still have to squaffle. They have to work where we, we, we now find everything at the shop when we're in the urban settings. It is not uncommon to find undernutrition and obesity existing side by side within the same country, the same community, the same household. And this is now the World Health Organization stating this. So the general appearance of, of the figure has not changed as of 2015 January maps, where you can see these red flagged areas of uh, obesity and you can see yeah the southern part of Africa we feature we are featuring there the Lancet study May 2014 conducted by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation 
at the University of Washington was a first of its kind analysis of data between 1980 and the 2013 from 188 countries. So I want to know you to know this is not just small little gimpy little things that I've pulled somewhere from Google. That's not where it comes from. So Africa has the highest overweight obesity rate in the sub-Sahara Africa. Seven out of ten women and four out of ten men have significantly more body fat than was deemed healthy. This is our reality. And these results correlate with a 2011 health survey conducted by a pharmaceutical company, Glasso Smith Klein, that pronounced South Africa the third fattest nation in the world. Uh, we thought it was the Americans, but we've actually passed the Americans. So it's found that 61% of the South African population is overweight or obese. This is almost double the global rate of nearly 30%, according to the World Health Organization. The Rainbow Nation is eating itself slowly to death according to the drug and healthcare company. We're chowing on our death. Slowly but surely that's happened. Despite the country's sporty sort of reputation and the prevalence of gyms and cities, as Johannesburg the research has found that 49% of South Africans do not exercise and 71% have never dieted. Now, by the way, I don't, I don't believe in diets and I'll be very clear on that. I believe in lifestyle change. Look at this. People in Cape Town are the worst affected with 72% overweight, closely followed by residents of Pretoria, then Johannesburg, and then Durban. So I'm not speaking to the real right audience now. I should speak to the Cape Townians. There's some complications with obesity that we need to look at. And as you saw with the inflammation, and I, saw, uh, and I gave you that little diagram where it affects most of the organs, I want to tell you, if you look at this diagram, then I need you to know that most of our organs, most of our systems in our body is negatively affected uh, by obesity. <coughs> Excess weight impairs health and shortens our life. As little as 5 to 7 kilograms of extra weight can lay the foundation for many of today's degenerative diseases. But what we're saying is, 5 kilograms shortens my life by one year. 10 kilograms shortens my life by? You make the sums. Every extra 5 kilograms of weight... My lifespan is shortened by as much as one year, and one year, and one year. And when you look at the stats, this is true. So why are we getting so big? Why are we getting so big? The key to the problem lies in the ever more widespread sedentary lifestyle and a diet overrich in calories and fats. People, we are living the Western lifestyle. This is what it dictates. By the way, the statement that I've just read comes from the World Health Organization. So it's not my statement. They are saying this is the problem. Obesity increases risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, coronary heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease, cancer, osteoarthritis, back pain. The list goes on. My screen is not big enough. In the nurses' study, which included 114,000 female nurses, the risk of diabetes increased 40-fold with BMI increased from 22 to 35. Not a big major up, but can you see the risk? 40-fold risk, high risk. Obesity is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease, which is relative risk of exposure 2.8 to 3.4 for women, men and women respectively. So it puts you into a higher risk area. Obesity associated with significantly increased risk of hypertension. We spoke about that. And we said one of the things that we have to look at is our normal weight. 
According to a recent population-based survey, including 195,000 randomly selected American adults, obesity was associated with a relative uh, adjusted risk of 3.5 for hypertension. If you see these little numbers on my screens, that's my research. That's where I know how to go and find. If you would ask me, where do you get that research? And some people say, oh, so where do you get that research? <laughs> uh, yeah, I find it. Yeah, this is where I get it. So, uh, yes, osteoarthritis is significantly increased in overweight individuals. I want to tell you that it really comes down to some good lifestyle choices. Then there's some psycholo psychological and uh, social issues that we have to look at. I mean, there is these, is these factors. We find these people that are overweight and are obese, they have depression problems. They've got more depression problems. They've got lower self-esteem. They, they, they tend to have social isolation. There's a rapid increase of eating disorders, especially among young people in, and that is really frightening. Young girls with, you know, things like bulimia and anorexia and, yeah, there's quite a few variations on that. And then we get all these, you know, magazines and these articles. I mean, you just get them on Facebook and you get them on WhatsApp messages, you know, talking about you know, this miracle diet, and I've just done this, and in 10 days' time, I lost so many cages, and, and um, how to lose weight, and uh, who do you believe? You know, the struggle, discouraged, and overweight persons, they will, they will grasp at any straw that they can get to get their weight down. And so they grab at these things, and we see a, a big challenge. Many times these guys have now been on these fag diets for 18 months and they come to us when, you know, everything has failed and um, they've got now kidney damage and they've got liver damage because of these, of these diets, you know, high protein, low carb diets and whatever. And uh, some people are getting rich by selling these books, you know, that, that educate people to do this. Um, almost any new diet will work for a, for a while. I can tell you this is what's going to happen for a short while. But the sad truth is that 90% of the dieters will regain that lost weight within one year. That's stats. I'm showing stats with you. And I've dealt with many people, you know, on this level. Uh, there, there are saner voices reminding people that there are no shortcuts, no magic pulls. Uh, we need to adopt a healthier way of losing weight and ways that will last. So it's not just going to be, you know, for a few months and then I'm back to square one. So I want to share with you 10 steps to a healthy weight. 10 steps to a healthy weight. Proven principles that not only will bring down the kilograms but will reward you with a healthier, more energetic, happier life than you could ever imagine. People do not believe me when I say, on our 10-day program, I've seen people lose 10 kgs. When you would interview those people and say, you know, and I've had one of those interviews, and the interviewer asked, I just, I just witnessed this, the interviewer asked, so did they starve you? I mean, 10 kgs in 10 days. He said, no, I've eaten more than I've, I used to eat. What I do need, do need to say is, you know, the person actually lost about three and a half kgs in the first two days. Now, that's impossible. But for the first time, they actually had a bowel movement. The baby was born. Three and a half kgs of it. They carried that for years. Are you getting what we're trying to say? And we live with this day to day. I mean, we, I mean, you must see this person's color, you know, it just changes. You know, this gray color changes to this healthy color. And when you talk to this person, it says, you know, I feel, I now feel what it feels like to live. I was just dragging on. 
everything they were dragging onto whatever was in this column. It was such a long time. So I'm just going to give you 10 safe principles of not only bringing down those kilograms, but actually having this joy and this health long term. Number one, don't go on a diet. Don't go on a diet. And it normally starts here in January, you know, after Christmas. Where we've loaded and loaded and loaded, you know, and we've got a lot of excuses, you know, family was here and it's Christmas. And by the way, that verse that says, you know, end time event sign. <laughs> I see this Christmas time, you know, people start now, but now, but now, I mean, we now, we've got now like a few weeks before then. We start building up the rations. The freezer gets loaded. The cupboards, you know, the shelves are bending with the weight. You know what I'm talking about. So the number one thing, guys, January we say, yes, all of this, I need to, I'm going very slow now, I must go faster. So I need to get rid of some of this weight. And so we go on this diet. And um, we change our eating habits. But we need to change it permanently. Eat, change your eating habits. Don't go on a diet. Diet, guys, is merely a, a temporary interruption to your normal eating habits. The very ones that may have caused you to gain the weight in the first place. Uh, you don't need a new diet. By the way, there's a lot of them. Just Google. Mm. There's such a lot of them. We need a new dietary lifestyle. That's what I want to advocate, number one. Number two, eat a good breakfast. Have you heard this before? Why do we say this? Why do we say eat a good breakfast? Eat like a king. Why do we say that? Question. Why are we saying it? Okay, that's a good analogy. You know, we need, you know, we need that fuel to get up for the day. And we're going to stay in the air for the day. Thank you for that analogy. People, we need to have a good breakfast to have to boost that energy. To increase your attention span. And it will heighten your sense of well-being if you have a good breakfast. I've got studies on all of these. And it's, not a, it's, it's really not rocket science to do this. We find with a good breakfast that you have less chronic disease. We find that studies show that you have a longer life. We show that you would have better health. You would have better scholastic records. Better attention span. This is why that many countries have you know, a, 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 a feeding scheme where they, where they actually feed the students, the scholars, and breakfast for the morning. The school would do that. The government would do that because they see better outcomes. So we need to have that big variety of, I mean, a breakfast is not just a piece of toasted bread and a cup of coffee. Not at all. I need to have my, my grains there. I would have my fruits there. I need to have my bread there. Um, and it would be whole grain. It will be all whole grain products. So I have the, the slow release energy. I need that fiber to do that. Jump start your day with a whole grain cereal. This is one of my special breakfasts where I would have my porridge, I would have my fruits, and then I would have my whole grain bread, and I would have my avocado pear. That's the one thing that is going to be in heaven, I'm sure, because I'm going to heaven. I don't know about you. I'm really planning to go there by God's grace. And uh, there's going to be avos every day, not just sometimes. And there's going to be tomatoes, and I love tomatoes, and you see some olives there, I love tomato olives, and I've got some tofu there, and I've got some basil there. And this meal would give me about 30 to 35 grams of protein. By the way, it's not the worms that were in the fruits. The proteins was in that food that I'm just sharing you, plant food, 35 grams of protein. That will give me a slow-release energy level right through the day. Well, at least five to six hours and even longer number three it's simple people i'm going to give you this very simple things 
Break the snack habit. Break the snack habit. The calories you get from snacking can add up to an extra meal a day, and a big one for that matter. Just go and make the sums if you really want to work on calories. <laughs> I'm not there, but I mean, you can do that. One study showed that the Western women tended to snack four to five hundred calories a day. Are you, are you kidding that? At the rate of 500 calories per day, seven days a week, totaling 3,500 calories, that means possible gain. That is, that's what we're talking about. So that's an extra kilogram per week that we are talking about on snacking alone. Many people are able to control their weight just by kicking the snack habit. People, I want you to know that we would need to get to the point, and I believe God is active here. God wants to help us here. You know, if I don't have the willpower to say no to food, because sometimes when food is there, you just want to eat it. it I mean, the food talks to you. I mean, the food tells you, eat me. Eat me. And I know the feeling. I'm a human being. I know what you what you might be going through. But we need to get, and if I don't have the willpower to say, no, no, that's not good for me. And by the way, I've got a good reason why I would not do it. I don't want to relive what I've lived in my life. So that's a good motivation to me. I'm not going to go that route again. I don't eat in between meals. But if you need, ask God to help you. I mean, He's promised. Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He will help you. When is the time that I should eat? Why are you so quiet? We don't want to say this, but guys, never eat when you're hungry. That's the whole principle. We teach people that in our centers. We teach that people that in our breathe three programs. The whole principle is don't eat when you hungry. When should I eat? Meal time. You need to have your set meal times, and that's the time you're going to eat, and you're not going to eat anything in between meals. And if you need strength, you need to ask God to help you with this. Ask, ask your family members not to let food stand around that says to you when you walk into that kitchen, come eat me, come eat me. Avoid that. Avoid that. Eat, number four. Eat mainly unrefined, unprocessed foods. Build your diet around fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes, and other natural foods. I mean, there's, there's some good foods, and they must, they must look good. I mean, they must be colorful. They must be tasty. I mean, we... we, we People think when I, when I say, you know, eat plant food, they think I'm eating celery sticks and carrots. That's absolutely not what I'm eating. I mean, the diet that I'm following for 20 years now, it's like, it's like so appetizing. I mean, you have to really restrain yourself not to eat too much. It is there. It's a problem. The food should be high in fiber. It should... It should uh, be low in, 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 in dangerous types of fats. And, uh, and it will then fill you up with fewer calories. And this is what we need. This will bring your weight down drastically. People, I want you to know that I need about five or more servings of fruits and vegetables daily. That's what I need. When we talk about a serving... It will be when it is fresh and cooked, it will be a cupful. That's a serving. If it's something that is cooked, it will be a half a cup. That is called a serving. All right? So just to give you an idea of how to balance that. So the National Academy of Sciences recommends that Americans eat five or more servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And one of the fruits should be a high in vitamin C and one of the vegetables high in vitamin A. And, uh, you know, we can look at that detail if we want to. 
Six servings of beans and grains daily. And when we look at the grains, it should be unprocessed grains. Very, very unlikely that you would get that just from the shelves. Uh, you need to go and look for unprocessed grains, things that have not been tampered with. Unrefined foods such as olives and corn, sesame seeds, you know, mealies, um, they provide, you know, those fats that uh, we would not have a problem with. Even if you have a little bit more than you should, it's not going to bring you a problem. They are, they are good fats. Sugars found in fruits is not nearly as concentrated as refined sugars, which is used in cooking or, or making of, of candy or, or, or cookies. What we are saying is, people, even when I sweeten my porridge, and I'm not saying eat dull porridge without sweetener, use natural sweetness. What is natural sweetness? It's like honey, it's like dates. And the question is, can you take a date, put it in your mouth, chew it nicely, and take another one, put it in your mouth, and chew it? And can you do that? Oh, you probably could, but what are you going to feel? Can you take honey, tablespoon, put it in your mouth, mm, 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 lack of honey, take another one? Can we do that naturally? No, there's a natural gagging effect that says, oh, oh, too much sugar. Will that happen when you eat sharp chocolates? No. You eat the whole slab up. You intend it just to eat two little blocks because we need to stretch it for the week and you eat the whole and you says to, you says to wifey, I think we need to get some more supplies. And we go in the shop and we go and, you know, to buy some more supplies. This is what happens. The same we find with our refined foods. I mean, I, if I would eat a bread to get satisfied and I eat a white bread, I will basically eat two breads. Two whole breads. And then I still won't be satisfied. But the bread that I bake, I will have two slices and I'm satisfied. There's a big difference. I don't have to chew that white bread. I just bite it. I just swallow. That's all. It's easy. So all wheat bread as, uh, as contrasted with white flour bread. Brown rice rather than white rice. And uh, that, that's some of the, of the examples that we can use. We need go to go for that, for that real stuff. Don't go for the refined stuff. People, all the fiber is taken out of that white bread. All the germ out of that wheat is taken out. They are left with the sperm, and I tell you what, that sperm is not as white as what you are getting the bread off. How do they get the, wet, the, bright, the, the, the bread white is like that? They use bleaches. They use chemicals. I've just had a long conversation with at least three of our bakery companies in our, com in, our, in our country asking, why is this in the bread? Why is this in the bread? Why is that? And all of them came with the same answer. Government is dictating that's what needs to be in the bread. I was like saying, are you saying to me the government is dictating that that and that? Yes. That's fair practice of business. So you can't have a secret formula in that because it's fair practice of business. Everybody has to have the same thing in the bread. So all the chemicals and all these different uh, breads, they are there. That's why I couldn't touch them. I'm sick if I eat it. I'm really very sick. Refining of, of food concentrates. Uh, calories. You'd have to eat a lot of ears of corn to get as many calories as in one tablespoon of oil. And this is what we're doing all the time, especially when we come to refined foods and fast foods, especially. Load it with these fats. Here's another example. We find about 30 to 40 calories in a fresh peach. But no, we eat a canned peach because that's nicer. But we're talking about 90 calories. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. It's, you see, life is about choices. Number five. Number five, to get this thing sorted out. I need to, re to reduce the oils and the butters and the dressings and the other fats. It seems like we cannot chew and make my, my enzymes and my saliva mix well and that form the bolus that swallows and that goes down my, my throat. I have to have something that makes it slide down. 
And so we need to have the dressings and the oils. And that is a big, big problem. Avoid, avoid meats high in fat, cholesterol, you know, cooking with those oils, salad oils, sauces. You know, we have to eat everything with some other sauce because we have to pamper the, the tastes. Um, yeah. Use spreads and nuts sparingly. I told you earlier, in one of the earlier sessions, you know, don't try and now take, you know, I've been on a, like a 300 grams of protein steak, you know, one shot, I eat it, you know, uh, and now I try to use nuts in its place, so I use a 300 grams of nuts. By the way, number one, you'll get bankrupt very quickly. And number two, that is just such a protein overload, you won't believe it. Four almonds is equal to 100 grams of steak protein. Four almonds. So uh, people, and I want to tell you, there's a big misconception about proteins. A male, adult male, should not have more than 58 grams of protein per day. More than that is overload to the system. No wonder cancer is like exploding. A woman, 48 grams of protein per day. That's what she needs. She doesn't need hundreds of grams. Number six, you need to drink water. We are not drinking enough water. We don't realize that an adult man, 70% of an adult man, and a little rock will be for rimpled by now, but 70% of him is water. So when we talk younger people, it's, it's, it's even, it's even a, a bigger ratio. So I need to drink at least eight or more daily uh, glasses of water per day. In a high humidity situation like we are now, you will have to step it up to at least 10 glasses of water per day. That accounts for about two liters of water. And um, most people don't drink enough water. They drink soft drinks, yes. And they drink beer. And they drink coffee. And uh, colas. Beverages. They don't drink water. Our body needs water. And that means you're getting a lot of calories, but not nutrition. There's no nutrition. There's no value in what you are drinking. So drinking calorie-loaded beverages is one sure recipe of gaining weight. That's a big reason. Um, look at the average stats. They will show you. Normal person in our urban areas would drink at least two to three soft drink glasses per day. And that is calories that is unnecessary. Switch to water. Uh, it's the slender person's drink of choice. Uh, often we think we are hungry and eat when in reality we're thirsty. Your body says I need something and you, you interpret it as I need food. Don't test it. I mean, now somebody asked me earlier today, now, okay, when will I know it's hunger or it's thirst? And we're saying, guys, go and drink the water and you'll realize, okay, it wasn't actually food I needed. I needed water. Something we don't realize is the moment your body tells you that I am thirsty, it's actually very late already. You're already dehydrated when that happens. So we need to get into a system where we drink enough water and, uh, and do that regularly. Number seven. Old story. I believe we'll have a shocking stat if we would ask in this audience who's got a daily exercise program. We will be shocked. I know it <laughs> because I work with audiences all the time. We need a daily exercise program. Regular daily exercise program. It will boost your metabolism. You know, we start using things to boost our metabolism. So we use this whey powder and we use this and we use that to boost our metabolism. Guys, just get on an exercise program. It's also increasing your energy and uh, endurance and lifts your spirit. I mean, just go for that jog when you're down. You'll find when you come back, that down spirit is gone. Exercise is a high-yielding investment. It's something that you invest for long term. And you need to just get into that, that program. 
Walk after meals. It's best not to linger. You know, we sit around after, after lunch. And then those leftovers in that uh, nice decorations, they scream at you. Eat me, eat me. <laughs> and uh, no, rather just get up and go for a walk. Just get moving. 30 minutes a day. It's a good goal. Just set yourself a goal. 30 minutes a day. People a step like this. If you were just, and I'm going to give you my back. You don't mind that, eh? Don't throw me with something. But uh, just do this for 10 minutes. Are you with me? And you'll see you'll start slowly. You'll go faster and faster. 10 minutes a day. That's equal to 30 minutes walk on a level Evalu uh, level <coughs> surface. You getting there? Number eight. No harmful substances. Big problem. Allow no harmful substances into your body, such as alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, unnecessary drugs. These are addictive, expensive substances that either add calories to an overburdened body or increases your risk of illness. I've got so much research on this. Even a very simple thing like caffeine, guys, it's dangerous. One cup affects a lot of body systems. It affects your brain in such a way that you would not understand. I want to tell you there's a reason that I'm saying this. Number nine, and I'm trying to get through this very quickly. Number nine, eat three regular meals daily. When we say regular, we say time. It's now time for meal time. Now I'm saying three or less meals a day would actually help you to keep your blood sugar levels controlled. People, if you are encouraged to eat five to seven meals a day, then I want to tell you, whoever's told that to you, they've climbed out of Noah's Ark. They need a little bit more scope. All right? So I'm not downing anybody, but it's actually causing a lot of insulin resistance that could be prevented. So eat three regular meals a day, about five to six hours apart. No snacking in between. With a smaller meal at night, we say, eat a breakfast like a king. Eat a lunch like a prince. Eat a supper like a pauper, like a beggar. That will be the answer. And uh, that will give your tummy some rest. I'm fasting on a daily basis. By the way, there's not a lot of research that, that says, you know, Regular fasting has really got a big benefit to the body. And I'm, I'm fasting by, daily. And it was not something that I've, you know, cognitively decided. But you can just imagine. My normal diet would, uh, and program in my day would, would dictate that I eat my breakfast at 9 and I eat my, my lunch at 3 o'clock. That's at the end of the day. Now count from 3 o'clock when I ate my last lunch till tomorrow morning. Count the hours. How many hours? Where's our mathematicians? 18 hours. You know what the dictionary says? It says abstinence from food for any period belong, longer than 12 hours is identified as a fast. That means I'm fasting every day. And this is the reason why it comes to breakfast. I'm ready for that food. And my tummy and my digestive organs are ready for the food. And it will digest it properly and done the job quickly, done over with, ready for the day. And the same will happen with this afternoon. And then it will rest. So I want you to know that there is big and good sense in this. Studies show that calories eaten in the late afternoon or evening stay with us more than calories eaten early in the day. They stay with us. What do we say? What happens to them? With, to, to it when it stays with us. Chupi. You know Chupi? Yeah? That's Chupi stories. So in the evening we are generally less active and don't need more food. 
and calories. And some people find that fasting from food for a day every week also may have a great, great benefit. I don't need that because I'm actually fasting every day. You make choices. Number 10. It's easy eh, to get to this 10. And that is uh, trust in God for help. Trust in God for help. Courage. Faith in the healing power of God is of great importance, people. I cannot and I will not survive one day if God is not involved in just my choices of lifestyle. I would not survive. I need to ask Him. I mean, I, what I need to do, and that's what I need to do on a daily basis. Now, I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm saying this is what I'm doing. On a daily basis, I surrender my appetite to God. I'm saying, Lord, I submit this to you. You know me. I'm going to see something and I'm going to free it. I put it like I'm going to eat it. I'm just going to eat it. So I'm saying I'm surrendering this to you. I submit my appetite to you. I want to have you as part of this sanctuary. This temple where your Holy Spirit needs to live in. And I want to do what would just bring the best circumstances for your spirit. Courage, faith in the healing power of God is of great importance. Most of us lack what it takes to always choose the best food or eat them in the right quantities. Our loving Lord, people, is yearning to assist us in gaining the victory over self. And I want you to know that I can claim that mighty promises that the Lord gives us in the Bible that I can accomplish anything with Him. I can o even overcome this appetite thing. I can overcome it by His grace. God can do it for you. And I've seen so many people have victory. And you know what? I wish I had opportunities where some of these guys can just stand up here and just tell the testimonies of, you know, the problems that they've had and how it's been reversed. I had one lady of 72 coming on one of our training programs. By the way, listen to this carefully. She didn't come on one of our treatment programs. She came on our training program where we've got an intense 10-day program where we teach them how to live and so that they can live, uh, they can teach others. So it's a, it's a TOT program, a, a trainer of training program. And I have had this lady of 72, you know, arriving at this program. She can hardly walk 60 meters. And that's the honest truth. When we did a fitness test, I said, guys, I don't know if this lady's going to make it this week. But you know, guys, God can make the difference. She had a she had determination. This old lady of 72, she had a determination. I'm going to do this. When I said to her, are you sure about this? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And you know what? On the 10th day, she walked five kilometers with me at my pace. Hendrik Poseidon, I gave you this example, and I said to you, Remember, it's not too late. It's not too late to make that changes. In his case, he couldn't walk six meters. They bring a chair, then he sits down. Then they, he stands up, they grab the chair and run her six meters and put it down again so he can go rest again. Within five months, he walked six Ks with me at my pace, and he does it better ever since. It's not too late. It's not too late. Remember the sedentary work, television, computers, the internet, the easy availability of high-calorie foods are creating not only obese adults, but super fat children. Just look around you. These children are pre-exposed to a host of related illnesses as well as serious psychological problems. It's not nice to be called fatty every time somebody wants to address you. And sometimes we are, we are creating this in the atmosphere that we are creating in our homes. So we need to set an example. Good health is a family affair. And let me tell you how it ripples out. 
I'll sit down with Hendrik and Rita beside note. By the way, big guy. When he walked into my, my office, it became dark and then it became light again. He had his little finger, thick little, thick little finger under my nose. I was, I was like, I was like terrified, you know, that first few seconds when he said to me, now listen carefully. He says to me, now listen carefully. Don't try and convince me about this or that. I thought, please Lord help me. <laughs> then he got, he got on and he said, just tell me what I must do and I'll do it. He was desperate. Sat down with his wife. And I started rolling out, two hours, rolling out. The musts and the must nots. Avoid this, take this in your lifestyle. By the way, 22 years bought it at that point. 95 units of insulin. Cannot walk six meters. He's like 155 kgs. He's a big man. They start changing things in their home. They started baking their own bread. They started eating only old food. I asked him in, a, in front of an audience, I asked so, uh, Hendrik, what diet are you guys following? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm following the Bible diet. Explain. What's a Bible? No, as the Lord gave us, Genesis 1 verse 29. He sorted that out. I didn't tell him that. He sorted out. I'm eating the Bible diet. Genesis 1 verse 29. That's the diet I'm eating. They've got one child still in home that is, um, that's autistic. And so obviously when they change their lifestyle, this little girl is now eating the same way that they do. She's 26 years old. She works in a factory in Somerset West. She does packaging. Uh, beautiful ways of creating, you know, something for everybody. And so this girl is really performing well in the factory. Packaging. Guys, within six months on this diet, this girl gets a promotion. She's autistic. She's a teller. If you go to that factory now today, she's a teller there, and the boss will tell you if there's somebody that balances up, it's her. She's autistic. They changed the lifestyle. This girl he just picked up. She's using the seed. She's using it. She's not rebelling at anything. She's using, instead of the fine, refined bread, she's using whole grain breads. This girl has lost weight. She's got a figure back. You would never say she's autistic in the way. If you talk to her, it's like comparison of what can be and what God wants us, where he wants us to go. I want to end with a, with a beautiful verse in Luke 21, verse 34. And, you know, this is, this is really the verse that I was coming to. I'm saying we, I believe, living at the end of time. Amen? We're living at the end of the time. And I want to tell you that Jesus, yeah, it was his words, he's prophesied then that we will have global obesity and now it is like that. We've got more people obese than people that are hungry. Luke 21 verse 34 says, and take heed to yourself. So that, you know, you take responsibility for yourself. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, with overeating, and drunkenness, and cares of these, this life. And so that the day come upon you unawares. So that the Lord will come and you are not ready for Him to come. Be careful. Be careful. So it's a simple thing like my appetite could actually cause me to miss that beautiful day. Now, guys, I am not preaching righteousness by fork. But I want you to know that my fork can cause me to miss the kingdom. Are you hearing what we're saying? My fork can actually cause me to miss the kingdom. I'm not talking about righteousness by fork. So it's not by what I eat that's going to give me salvation. Not at all. Salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. May God bless you as you make good choices in your own life. 
where you decide, I want to go this way or that way. You know, when I talk to the children with the brain power seminars, and we present this now even at primary school level, and I would go in with a, with a, with a Bible verse like Psalms 103 verse 5 that says, you know, who gives you the good food? To satisfy your mouth. Rhetoric question. That will make you be like, having the strength like a young eagle. That's what the verse says. So I asked the kids, I said, who of you wants to be a chicken? You know what chickens do? They walk around, they scratch in the dust, they pick up a worm and they suck it down. Or who wants to be an eagle just soaring up there? What do you think the kids say? I mean, they're small. They say, we want to be an eagle. We want to be an eagle. We don't want to be a chicken. And I say, very good, because if you're an eagle, remember, eagles eat chickens. <laughs> and I'm saying to you guys, guys, it's about choices. You can choose. Do you want to be a chicken or do you want to be an eagle? Be careful. Eagles eat chickens. <laughs> May God bless you in your choices. Remember, your health is your choice. I cannot dictate to you. I hope that you got the message that I am not, I'm, I've not one moment had any, any inclination to judgment in whatever I presented. All I want to say to you is, guys, I've been there. I've nearly died. I nearly lost my life. And I'm saying, guys, let's not walk the same walk. It's the most sad thing for me to visit people with these lifestyle diseases while they're suffering. It's the saddest thing for me. I know God doesn't want that. May God bless you. Let me pray for you. Our gracious, mighty, heavenly Father, what a great God you are. In spite of our stiff nakedness and our hot-heartedness, attitude that says, you know, leave my plate alone, it's got nothing to do with you. You are always patient. You are not judgmental. But Lord, we know that the outcomes could be so much different. You want us to accommodate your spirit in us. And sometimes we just don't allow that by our choices. I pray that each one of us, as we sit here today, will make a decision, not for tomorrow, but for today. Lord, I want to give my body as a living sacrifice to you. I want to encourage your Holy Spirit to come and live within me. And Lord, please, I help, help me to submit, and I want to surrender my appetite to you. I don't want to be dictated to want to eat that or want to eat that because of this whole crave thing. I don't want to be there, Lord. I want to do what's best for your spirit that wants to live in me. And I pray for each one. Help us to make that decision. Don't let us leave it till tomorrow. Help us today to make that decision. Thank you for victory that we would have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for Jesus for setting the example. And I leave this beautiful people with you in this audience, those that will, that will be looking at this DVD, that you will help them right now, Lord, to have victory in you, our Savior. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.